if you think that you've had setbacks and failures, that's because you don't really have the thing that's really on fire for you. Because when you are really doing something you're really inspired to do, you don't see failure, you see feedback. Today, I'd like to talk about uh, the genius that you may or may not be aware of that you have inside and how to awaken that genius and realize the things in your life <clears throat> that have led you to where you are today and the components of it that, is, that can awaken this genius. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about my own journey just so you can put it into context. Because I really believe that the things that you experience in your life, <clears throat> throughout your life, are ultimately on the way, not in the way. Ultimately, giving you the, exactly the experiences that you need in order to do something really extraordinary on the planet. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off with myself, and then I'll, I'll apply it back into your own life. When I was born in uh, 1954, I apparently was positioned in an awkward position in the womb, or maybe I was implanted in a side, side position, I don't know. But when I came out, my arm and leg on the left side was turned inward. <clears throat> and so when I was a child, I think from about age one and a half, I had to start wearing braces on my arm and leg. They called it pigeon foot and you know, pigeon arm. <clears throat> I uh, did not like to wear, wear braces. I didn't like the constraint. They were clunky, heavy things. Made me kind of do a Forrest Gump kind of thing. The few kids in the neighborhood that would see these things would not, um, what's the word? They'd feel awkward being around it. I just wanted to be out of the braces. And I didn't have to wear them 24 hours a day, but I did have to wear them. And in the process of doing that, I think I wanted to be free. I think that was a, a catalyst for me to want to be free and to um, not be constrained. <clears throat> so here's something that it seemed to be in the way, but it turned out to be exactly what I needed in my journey. I uh, also had a speech problem. For some reason, I, I didn't, uh, could not pronounce things properly. And I remember going about a year and a half old, I remember going into a place with my mom in this building where I used to do all these muscle exercises with strings and buttons and things in my mouth. And uh, to try to use my mouth properly to be able to do it because I would mispronounce things as they were starting to, starting to speak. <clears throat> so I had a speak, speaking issue. When I was five, four, I got out of my braces. And by the time I was, and I had, I also sucked my thumbs. So my teeth were, my front teeth were way forward. Kind of like, uh, um, well, you've seen people with buck teeth. And I later got, I ran into a tree on a horse and broke them and pushed them back, which is interesting. My dad said I saved, saved him a fortune. When I got to first grade, kindergarten class, I was, I wanted to draw with the girls <clears throat> and I didn't want to draw with the boys. The boys were drawing army and cars and things. And I wasn't into that. And I wanted to draw uh, landscaping, landscapes. And my teacher said, you're not a girl. You can't play with the girls. You're supposed to play with the boys. And she dragged me over to the boys side. And <clears throat> I didn't want to draw that. So she finally sat me in the middle. She said, if you're not going to play with the boys, I'm not going to let you play with the girls. You're going to have to sit and play with yourself in the middle of the room. <laughs> So I think that was a part of a perfection because I think everything I do is about the middle path between these two polarities of, of you know, gender. And I want to be free and I want to be able to be heard because people, when I would speak, it wouldn't make sense. When I got to first grade, <clears throat> I was being told to, to, taught to learn. Big old book with a stick and going through all the letters and stuff and pronouncing letters and trying to make words and things like that. And I definitely had dyslexic symptoms and I could not do it. No matter what I tried to do, I just kept flumbling words and I didn't get meaning out of it. No matter what, I would see letters and didn't 
grasp meaning. The semantics didn't make any sense. And so I went from the normal reading class to a remedial reading and from a remedial reading to wearing a dunce cap with a guy named Daryl Dalrymple. I don't know whatever happened to him, but <clears throat> we used to have to sit out and face the window, looking out into the outdoors until we decided we were going to read properly. That was the treatment and wearing a dunce cap. <laughs> and that dunce cap, by the way, is conical, which I use in my diagrams today on my work on cones uh, as conic sections. <clears throat> But my teacher finally had the, the, my parents come to the school and say, you know, I'm afraid your son's got learning problems. I'm afraid he's never going to be able to read. He's not going to be able to write because I wrote backwards. I still have an awkward handwriting. It's still, you can see that today. And uh, he's not going to be able to read. He's not going to be able to write. He can't seem to communicate. I, I don't think he's going to go very far in life or no amount to anything. And I remember that sitting in that little room when she said that. And <clears throat> that wasn't the coolest thing to, to face. But what I did is I got it through school by befriending the smartest kids. There was a Martha Rose Scartosi with a, a beautiful little girl that I used to like to walk home, but I did it for two reasons. I'd walk her home because I liked looking at her, but I also would ask her what she got out of the class and she would tell me what she got. And as long as somebody would tell me things auditorily, um, I seem to be able to get enough information that to somehow be able to get through school. And I befriended Jerry Samson and Clinton Duvall and all these other individuals were the, were the intelligent kids in the class and befriended them and constantly asked them about their, what they learned and what they did and how do they do it and how they're so smart. And I think I figured out a strategy to ask questions to get information from people, which by the way is what I do today. <laughs> <clears throat> what I do, uh, consulting with people. So that worked really fine until I got to um, about sixth grade. And when I turned 12 years old in sixth grade, I had passed school with that strategy and become the clown of the class kind of thing. But that didn't work when my parents moved from Houston, Texas to Richmond, Texas. And there we were in a kind of a low socioeconomic school system with a lot of racial issues. And there was no really smart kids that I could befriend and get information from. And I ended up failing and I eventually left school. I kind of left home at 13, but I formally left school at 14. I tried to go to school till I was 14. I then became a street kid. And I learned how to you know, get by on the streets, <clears throat> which I think is sort of entrepreneurial. And I, you know, lived in a bowling alley, a 24 hour bowling alley. I lived in a park area, I lived in a car. I lived in friends' houses. I, you know, I just kind of meandered around. There was a diner that I used to hang out with and, and sometimes stay there all night because it's a 24 hour diner, just lean on the table and uh, did odd jobs uh, that I could do. And by the time I was 14, I ended up leaving Texas. Um, I lived at the beach for a while at 14, but then I moved out to California, and visited California <clears throat> and down into Mexico. And going 15, going on 16, I, uh, I made my way to Hawaii and I was into surfing. That was the thing. I tried baseball, but baseball wasn't any fun in that small town. And um, so I went into surfing and Texas wasn't a surf capital, but California and Hawaii was. So I decided to go there. So I lived first under a a bridge at Kamehameha Highway on the Sunset Beach. I lived in the Ikai Beach Park under a park bench. I then, when it would rain, would go into the bathrooms there because it was protected from rain. I found an abandoned car, lived in an abandoned car. Eventually, I got a, a guy who was, had to get rid of a tent, and I got a tent, and I made a tent, tent uh, in a jungle and a, a mixture of palm leaves and kind of a treehouse tent thing. And I was... Uh, <clears throat> doing what I did, which was surfing at the time, pretty well every day. And then I ended up uh, with strychnine and cyanide poisoning and almost died when I was 17. My uh, <clears throat> 17th uh, year was uh, eventful, but I ended up having a Joe Cocker look. If you remember Joe Cocker, the singer with Leon Russell, uh, he had deformed movements and I was having those type of things from the strychnine. When I turned uh, 
a week before my, well, a few weeks before my 18th birthday, I, I, um, I really ended up unconscious in my tent for three and a half days. And I couldn't breathe. My diaphragm stopped on me. It's a very interesting situation. As a result of that, luckily a lady found me in my tent, helped me recover from a cathartic experience, took me to a health food store. Leaving the health food store, I saw a flyer on the door named Paul that was a, a special guest speaker at a recreational center called Paul with Paul Bragg at a yoga class. Somebody told me that if I wanted to control my spasms in my arms and stuff that that in, in legs would be a yoga class. So I went to a yoga class. And that one night uh, with 35 young people sitting on a wooden floor and little mats and towels, <clears throat> Paul C. Bragg um, did a presentation. Now I never went to presentations. So school wasn't my thing. I didn't read at the time. Um, and all of a sudden I'm at this class with this amazing teacher. And he, in, in a 45 minute to an hour presentation just blew me away. Just absolutely, what, what he said was that we have a body, we have a mind and we have a soul. The body must be directed by the mind. The mind must be directed by the soul in order to maximize who we are as a human being. And that we need to set goals for our, ourselves, our family, our community, our city, our state, our nation, our world and beyond for 120 years. And that what we think about, what we visualize and what we say to ourselves and how we feel about ourselves and what actions we take determine our outcome and destiny in life, kind of like the principles of the secret almost. And nobody had ever sp spoken to me like that. Nobody ever said that I had a potential inside. Nobody um, that I was aware of that really saw that in me. And I don't think he was pinpointing to me by any means, but the room was affected by his speech. He was a very animated, dynamic guy. And at the end of the presentation, he took us through a guided imagery meditation, what he called an alpha meditation technique. And in there, I closed my eyes. And after his speech, I was pretty inspired by what he had said. And I was, I saw a vision that in that meditation of me standing on a balcony, walking through an orched way area and coming out onto an edge of a balcony, standing on a balcony, speaking to a million people. And that was like, whoa. And I was in tears and I was inspired. And I had no idea that um, <clears throat> where that came from. I think it was a dissociative identity disorder at the time. And it was so real, I was in tears of inspiration. And I must have been in that vision 15, 20 minutes. It was real to me. And I, when I came out, I looked around the room and everybody in the room, in that room was in tears. So they must have had the similar type of experience, whatever it was for them. And I saw Paul Bragg sitting in the front of the room with his eyes closed, sitting with his hands on his knees, looking up, you can almost read his mind, thank you, dear divine, for revealing to these young souls their destiny kind of thing. And uh, <clears throat> I saw something there that I had not seen before. And at that moment, I realized that I, I really wanted to overcome my learning problems. I was the first night, I thought that maybe I could be intelligent. Maybe I could overcome my, my learning problems and learn how to speak and, and be intelligent someday. My sister named Lynn, who is the smart one in the, in, the, in the family, she could read and she was great at that. I was sort of like her anti-particle. She's always been a great reader and always been very intelligent. And I thought, wow, I would like to be able to be intelligent. And uh, so I, at the end of that experience, uh, he said, okay, that's our evening. And uh, if anybody would like to join me on the other side of the island in the mornings at six o'clock in the morning, I have a, a, an exercise and a lecture every morning. <clears throat> and so I got at 5.45 in the morning, I hitchhiked out to the other side of the island and uh, joined him. And uh, for the next few weeks, I learned everything I could from this guy. And I never, you know, everybody that he had around him at the time were much older, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80-year-old people. I was the only teenager there. And finally, after doing that each morning, I mean, I would literally get up and go surfing uh, after getting back. Um, he, he, he made an announcement that he's going to Santa Barbara or to Mount Shasta area or whatever, and that he will, will you know, hope to see you again kind of thing, but he's, he's leaving to go to California. And while he was there, it was inspiring because I thought, wow, this guy, 
is, is really, you know, making me think. And he's gave me a lot of great new information and things I never thought of and, and started making a, a belief that maybe I could do something with my life kind of thing. And I, uh, I didn't know what to do if, all the, if he's leaving. And I, and I finally walked up to him on that last day. I said, Mr. Bragg, um, you said uh, a few weeks ago at your talk in the North Shore that, that uh, whatever we decided that night for our life would be our destiny. And he said, that's exactly it, young man. And I said, well, sir, I, I, I saw that I wanted to be a teacher and I don't know how to read. I've got learning problems and speaking problems. And he said, that's not a problem. Is there any other problem? And I said, well, no, sir. And he said, he said, well, here's what you do. Every single day, every single day, I want you to say to yourself, I am a genius and I apply my wisdom. Now, when he, when he made me say that, he, uh, that didn't make any sense to me. I didn't really know what a genius was exactly. But he said, I want you to say that statement. I'm a genius and I apply my wisdom. So I said it. And he made me say it again and again and again and again until my eyes closed. And then when I said it and he could sense that there was some sort of meaning to it and I could relate to it, he patted me on the shoulder and he says, now you never miss a day for the rest of your life. Every day you say that statement. And if you do that every single day, certainly the cells of your body will tingle with it. And so will the world. So I've never missed a day this morning. I said it. I didn't know what the genius was, but I started saying it every day. Right after that, I never saw him again. But after that, I ended up going to the health food store and I pulled out on a rack of books. The first book I ever tried to read in my life, really, from cover to cover, was Chico's Organic Gardening and Natural Living. I uh, pulled out that book looked at the pictures. The guy in the front cover looked like me. So I thought if that guy can write the book, I bet I can read it. That's why I picked it. And it was mostly pictures of gardens, but I got it some gist of that book. And it gave me an encouragement to try to get another book. I tried to get that book and I got lost and I couldn't understand the words. But I made it a determination that I was gonna try to figure out how to learn to read. And uh, there was a guy in the tent <clears throat> that I was staying there with named Jackie he used to read to me. I'd asked him to read for me. I always wondered why. I never told him until he was 50 something. We met up again. But he, um, he did that for me. But I, I then was in a meditation and I, in the meditation, a little prompt said, it's time to go home and see your parents. So I ended up uh, flying to Los Angeles, hitchhiking back to Texas. <clears throat> when I went back, I remember hitchhiking down the last road to get close to my parents' house. My sister and Father drove right past me, didn't even recognize me because I had long hair and a beard kind of thing. And uh, I got home and my mom was inside cooking some prunes. And I uh, walked in and I said, or she turned around and she says, oh my God. And she didn't recognize me at first. She says, she thought I was just a guy walking in the house. And she said, oh my God, welcome home. And days later, she said, why don't you take a GED test? Because you never know when you might have to need a job and that would give you a job. Well, with their encouragement, I went down to the University of Houston. I took a GED. A GED is a general education degree. It's the equivalent of a high school degree. All you do is take a test. If you pass it, you have high school education. Well, I went down there <clears throat> and I didn't know how to read half the questions there. And I just closed my eyes. I said to myself, I'm a genius and I apply my wisdom. And I put the pencil on the paper and whatever little dot that I had to fill in, I did. I figured I got nothing to lose. If I don't pass, I've not lost anything. If I pass, I got me high school degree. In the process of doing that, I, uh, I passed. <laughs> it was a miracle. And uh, my parents were pretty astonished and I was blown away. And all of a sudden I had me a high school degree and I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. And I was thinking that there's power in this affirmation. So I was saying it more than once a day. And my parents said, why don't you take a college entrance exam in case you ever decide to go to college? The surf is not up until October. Why don't you take it, take it and try to try and do that? So I went down to Wharton and I, uh, I took a, a three-day test and I guessed when I said I, I'm a genius and I apply wisdom and friggin' somehow passed that test. And it's purely guessing. And I can't tell you how it was. It's something, some higher power working on it. But 
I passed the test. And then I decided I was going to try to take classes because now I have access to go to college. I decided I'll take a summer school class. And I took English and history. You had to take those as a basic. And I had a six week class. And when I tried to take that six week class, two weeks into that, we had our first test. And I thought <laughs> that my little tool of affirmation was going to do the job. But I got a 27 and I needed a 72 to pass. And I got a 27. I was the only kid that had that was down below 72. When I saw that, I was devastated. I ran to my car, sunk in my car. Finally, I drove home crying. And all of a sudden, this, this dream of being a, a teacher and traveling the world was shattered. <clears throat> and I remember coming home and curling up in a fetal position under this Bible stand uh, in my parents' house. And I was really having a low moment because I was thinking, I thought that I was going to go in this new trajectory, but if I can't even pass the test, then that's not going to work. This is never going to happen. And I kept hearing my first grade teacher in my head. And my mom came home from shopping. What she did, she said, she said, son, uh, what's wrong? What happened? And I said, mom, I blew the test. I guess I don't have what it takes. I guess I'll never be able to read or write or communicate or never mount thing, never go very far in life. I um uh, I'm sorry, I was apologizing to her because I felt like she tried to encourage me. And she didn't know what to say. She just kind of stared for a minute. And finally, she said something that only a mother could say that was deeply meaningful. She said, son, whether you become a great teacher, you learn philosopher like you dream. Whether you return to Hawaii and ride giant waves like you've done, or you return to the streets and pantangle as a boat. I just want to let you know that your father and I are going to love you no matter what. We just love you. When she said that, I needed that. She, she gave me love with certainty, presence, and gratitude, which I call the cardinal pillars of mastery. <clears throat> when she said that, my hand went into a fist. I looked up, and I saw the vision of me standing on that balcony in front of a million people again. And it was clear and lucid for a moment. And I said to myself with my hand in my fist, I'm going to mass this thing called reading and studying and learning. I'm going to mass this thing called teaching and, and philosophy. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to travel whatever distance. I'm going to pay whatever price to give my service of love. I'm not going to let any human being on the face of the earth stop me from this one. And I got up and I hugged my mom with tears in my eyes. I went into my room. I got a Funk and Wagnalls dictionary out. And I made a commitment that I was going to memorize that freaking dictionary. So I went in there and I took 30 words a day. And I went through 30 words a day, spelled them, wrote them out on a piece of paper, because we had little pads of paper. 30 words a day, spelled it, pronounced it properly, put it in a, a sentence, and to I understand its meaning. And my mom would test me on 30 words a day. And I would get those 30 words. And if I didn't get them, I would go back and I wouldn't go to bed at night until 30 words could be memorized, pronounced, spelled, etc. And my mom cared enough to make sure that I did that. And I was determined to do that. And my vocabulary grew slowly but surely, which is why I have a great vocabulary today, I believe. And, and I ended up starting to pass school. I didn't give up. And once I did, I wanted to learn more than any of the other kids in the class. They took it for granted. They were going there. Parents told them to do it. Everything else, I wanted to learn. So I lived in the library, and I stayed in that library. If I wasn't in class, I was in the library. And if I wasn't in the library, I was driving home. If I was driving home, I was reading a book while I was driving, turning the thing. Probably, And I was driving on the side of the road so I wouldn't interfere with traffic. And I would get home, and I would read. And I'd read encyclopedias. I didn't I didn't stop. Just I literally with a lap of my encyclopedia in my in my in my uh, knees all the time. And I just wanted to learn. And that went on. And by the time a few months had gone by, I was now taken off. I was excelling. I was passing. And then I was actually nailing it. I was working so hard on it, way more than most of the other kids. I started really doing well. And I started excelling. And students started to come and gather around me in the library and start asking me questions which was absolutely inspiring at 18 years old to have somebody ask you for information. And my teaching career began. I started teaching at 18. 
And I never stopped because it was one of the most inspiring things I got to do. Well, by the time I was turning 19, my mom asked me for my, right before my 19th birthday, my mom said, what do you want for your birthday and for Christmas? I said, mom, I want the greatest teachings on the face of the earth, the greatest writings humanity has ever created by the greatest minds who ever lived. And she said, you sure you don't want a t-shirt, son? I said, no, I want the greatest teachings on earth. I just want to learn. And my uh, mom said, well, let me see what I can do. So she contacted her brother who was professor. Well, he was Uncle Ralph to me, but professor at MIT and he was a chemist and physicist. And as a gift, I don't know where he got him. I don't know if it was his own library. He sent two giant six by six by six foot wooden crates on a flatbed truck to our home. And they literally were loaded them on the ground. I took a crowbar, went out there and took all those books and filled up my room with books, just stacks and stacks of books. I had a little yoga mat in the center where I could do my sun salute in the morning to the sun. And I sat and I did my yoga and I read. Every moment I was not in class or driving to and from, I was reading. I was reading when I was home. I was, I was knocking out 18 to 20 hours of reading every single day on every imaginable topic because these books were in all different topics. And I remember reading Rene Descartes' work and I thought, okay, I want to I wanna be a man of letters. I want to be a polymath. I want to understand. I want to have an encyclopedic mind now. I started reading eight encyclopedia sets, all of them, 20, 25 volumes each. I just wanted to learn everything I could. I wanted to be knowledgeable about it. I wanted to find the most universal laws that would help me go and do something amazing as a teacher. I wanted to have the foundation, the most powerful principles I could offer. So why am I saying this? Because today I'm living out the dream that I set out to do. I may not be traveling except by Zoom right now because of COVID, but uh, I made a dream that I want to go around the world and I want to teach. I've been to 154 countries traveling and speaking. I've done the breakthrough experience in 65 countries. And I, uh, I can tell you right now that if you never give up on something that's deeply meaningful to you, it's yours. But you have to be willing to do whatever it freaking takes. When I said to my mom, I'll do whatever it takes, travel whatever distance, pay whatever price to give my service of love, that's no turning back attitude is what gives you your result. Now, why am I saying this today? Because I didn't know what a genius was when I started, but my, my mom, when I came back to, from, from Hawaii and I asked her what a genius was, she says, well, it's like people like Albert Einstein and Da Vinci. I said, well, then get me every book that's been written on those guys. Let me start learning about them. I later learned that a genius is one who listens to their inner voice and follows their inner vision and lets the voice and the vision on the inside be greater and louder than all opinions on the outside. They're not living in conformity. They're living in enormity. They're living in a vision of what they want to create in this world. And I believe that everyone who's sitting here right now looking at this presentation has that inside you. I've been, I've been working. I used to do a little program called Activating Your Genius, right? Awakening Your Genius. And I looked at all the common denominators of some of the most ingenious polymathic individuals through history. And what were the common threads to them? And one thing I'm absolutely certain is they're pursuing something that absolutely inspire them, that they see in the vision, and they're innovating creative, unborrowed visionary information and new information that's cutting edge, that's an original novel that they don't, they don't subordinate, they don't cite other people, they're just originators. Kind of like uh, uh, John Nash in A Beautiful Mind when he's going out there looking at the pigeons and the algorithms of the pigeons, trying to find, uh, you know, a something original. Why everybody else is reciting other people and doing citations of other professionals and subordinating to their ideas and limiting their concepts. He's an original thinker. I have said since I was 18 to 20 years old, I said that I'm original, you know, thinker, original. I, I, I create original ideas that serve humanity. I create original ideas. <clears throat> and I wanted to create original ideas, something that no one's thought of. And I've done it. With the Demartini method, I've got it. I've created it. Something that serves. The information I, I share in the breakthrough experience is original. It's, it serves. So I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you set your mind to doing something that's deeply meaningful, that is really calling inside you, amazing doors of opportunity will keep doing if you persevere on it. It's, I, I've always said that if, if, if I stay with something long enough, everybody else dives out, you end up at the top. You just got to stay with it long enough. And perseverance is the key to that. <clears throat> if you stay perseverant towards something that's deeply meaningful, there, nothing's going to stop you from that if you 
have that much of a drive. In fact, if you think that you've had setbacks and failures, that's because you don't really have the thing that's really on fire for you. Because when you are really doing something you're really inspired to do, you don't see failure, you see feedback. That's been proven now in neurological studies. You see feedback, you say, okay, refinement. No, no stopping, fi refinement. So in your life, right now, if you scanned your life and looked at the voids that are determining your values, my voids of being constrained wanted me to free, which allowed me to now travel the world. My inability to speak made me want to articulate, now speak probably more voluminously than probably most ever speaker. My desire to want to not be constrained, maybe go to travel extensively, 20 friggin' million miles a year. They said I've never read, well, friggin' over 30,500 books now. And somebody said I would never, she said I would never communicate. Well, we've reached millions of people through every friggin' medium possible. So the very things that we're told that not, we're, we're not going to do may be the very things we're going to do. So when somebody says you can't do something, it may be the very gift. Right now, I wish that teacher in first grade was there. I'd give her a hug. Thank you for giving me exactly the voids I needed to help me get where I wanted to go in life. That was the most deeply meaningful path. She wasn't a mistake. She was on the way. The braces weren't a mistake. Every one of those components of my life were exactly what was needed to get me where I am today. And I'm certain after working with thousands of people in the breakthrough experience, I'm certain that the same thing is going on there. Because I see people that think, well, I, you know, I had a my mama wasn't there. She abandoned me or whatever. Great. Who became your mom? Well, I got this mom. And that was the lady that had more money and allowed me to go to school. And now I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm educated and I've done what I've done to do. Well, if you had your mom, you'd be blaming your mom for not being there. But the truth is, if she had been there, you might not have ever gotten to have that education. Never thought about that. We constantly compare our lives to fantasies of how it should have been instead of honoring the way it is and not honoring how those voids are giving us the gifts we need. So just know that everything in your life, if you look back at it, make an inventory of all the things that you've ever been through in your life that you thought were errors or mistakes or in the way or challenges or whatever. All those voids that you think are voids may not be voids, they may be gifts. Anything you can't say thank you for is baggage. Anything you can say thank you for is fuel. And I just want to share that story because hopefully that makes you look at your own life. Because there is a genius inside you. The genius is when you're authentic and integral to what it is that's really deeply meaningful to you. All of your judgments, all the things you're too proud or too humble to admit you see in other people inside yourself are all determining your voids in life. All the things that you judge out there as extremely pleasurable or painful are going to be stored in your subconscious mind as voids wanting to be neutralized and appreciated and loved. Everything that's going on in your life is actually part of the path. I always say that your highest value, our purpose in life is the most efficient, effective path to fulfill the greatest amount of voids, the greatest amount of values. So all of those things are on the way, not in the way. So anything you can't say thank you for is, is baggage, but anything you can say thank you for is because you've seen how it's catalyzed exactly what you needed to go to the next step. And all the jobs you've had and all the careers that you've done and all the experiences and the boyfriends and girlfriends or whatever the relationships you've had, all of them are giving you exactly the pieces that you need. And to not look and extract meaning out of your existence and not see how all of them are giving you what you're wanting in life is crazy. There's two things you want to master in life. One, you want to prioritize your life and fill your day with the highest priority actions, because when you live by high priority, you grow in self-worth and confidence. <clears throat> and the second one is to ask yourself, whatever's perceived in your life, how is it helping you fulfill what's highest on your value? How is it helping you fulfill your mission? Anywhere in your life, if you look back, if you think, well, that was in the way, that, that was a setback, and I'm a victim of that, ask how did that experience, exactly the way it was, how is it helping me get what I am here to do, my mission in life, my purpose in life, my highest value, and you wake up your genius, because when you're living by your highest value, you pursue challenges that inspire you, and that is the key to building genius, and a genius is simply the individual who's authentic with original ideas. And, you know, there's people out there jumping off bungee jumps and they're doing walking on coals and doing rope climbing and they're doing metaphors for courage and this kind of thing. But those are totally insignificant, totally insignificant compared to the courage it takes to be yourself. And by finding out what all these things are is guiding you to be yourself and willing to be yourself. 
and not fit in, but just to actually stand out as a unique individual with your unique contribution is the key to your genius. And so I just want to share my story on that. Some of you have heard this story, some of you may not have, but I want to share that story because I want you to look inside your own life and take a deep inspection, uh, introspection, reflection of all the magnificent things that are necessary in your life that are actually on the way that you may not have seen. And just know that anyone that you don't see on, on the way, in, on the way, that you see in the way is holding you back. But anything you see on the way is fueling you and, and no friction, but fuel. And I, I believe that inspiration and enthusiasm and uncertainty and presence and gratitude and love, uh, these, these transcendental feelings are confirmations that you're perceiving things in a way that's helping you fulfill what's really meaningful to you. So I just wanted to, to take that time to share that story because I'm a genius and I apply my wisdom that one statement impacted my life significantly. In fact, two years after I started saying that when I was at the Wharton College, I had a gathering of 17 students <clears throat> gathered around a table and uh, they were asking me questions on my, uh, on, on helping for a test, you know, I was getting ready to take a test. And I heard this one kid said that Martini is a friggin' genius. And I remember what Paul Bragg said immediately when I heard him say that, whispered it to another kid. When I heard him say that, I thought, wow, Paul Bragg said, if I said that statement every single day, sooner or later, the cells of my body would tingle with it and so would the world. And that night I went home and I filled literally a 24 hour day list of statements that I wanted to say to myself, because I thought if one statement can make a difference, why not fill my whole day with statements like that? And I realized that if I don't fill my day with high priority actions that inspire me, my day is going to fill up with low priority distractions that don't. So you might want to stop and reframe all the things that you've experienced in your past and see how they can be turned into statements about how you would love your life and recite those every day as a reminder, a checkup from the neck up, a reminder of what you really would love to do in your life. Because if you don't decide, nobody else is going to get up in the morning and decide. They're going to, they're going to project their values onto your life. They're not going to decide what you want. They're going to decide what they feel is wise for you. So take command of your life. Any area of you're not empowering, any area of your life you're not empowering, people are going to overpower. Take command. Recognize that it's all on the way. Decide exactly how you want it. Prioritize your actions. Prioritize your perceptions. And let's get on with going and releasing your genius onto the planet. So that's my message for this morning. I went a few minutes over, but I just wanted to share that in case that's a value to you. But do not, do not let anybody on the outside interfere with your inspiration on the inside. That's one thing that I learned that day when I, my mom told me she loved me no matter what. I was not going to let anything on this planet interfere with my mission, not even myself. Now, to close, I just want to share something. I had the opportunity to do a presentation called Discover the Hidden Order that Unites and Empowers Us All. I was a little uh, wild and on fire, I think. You know, I don't know. I, people have thought, wow, there's, their comments were wow, blown away kind of thing. Uh, it may be something that's not inspiring to you. I don't know. But all I know is if you want to find out how the hidden order is in your life and see how things are on the way and discover the magnificence of your life and ask new sets of questions so you're not letting the outside world and the apparent chaos interfere with what you really want in your heart, um, please take advantage of this. It's free. Get this. Take advantage of this. This is a very powerful presentation I did. I promise you it'll blow you away. Um, it's about discovering the hidden order in the chaos. And I went down the rabbit hole. I went deeper than typical. So please get it. Even if, if you're not ready for it, just get it. You're going to say thank you for getting it. And um, I just want you to listen to that maybe more than once. Because if, um, if you're interested in waking up your genius, if you're wanting to find the hidden order, if you want to be individuals that are inspired by your life, I'm, I believe that that little presentation I did you will, will be a, a very valuable. And, uh, pardon my sniffles a bit, but I, sometimes when I share that, I, it kind of gets to me. Thank you for joining me for this presentation today. If you found value out of the presentation, please go below and please share your comments. We certainly appreciate that feedback. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification icons. That way I can bring more content to you and share more to help you maximize your life. I look forward to our next presentation. Thank you so much for joining.